Welcome to Speed Talk Live, which isn't really live, but a poorly produced podcast where we talk about NASCAR and all things racing. And occasionally we have a special guest or two, when we can get them to show up. Set down, strap in, pull those belts tight, Speed Talk Live is on the air. Race car is in. Green flag, green flag, green flag. Welcome everybody, another week. Welcome to Speed Talk Live, coming out of Pocono. Man, we got a lot going on today, and I'm glad you're here joining in the conversation with us. We're going to be talking to, to Kyle Larson. We're going to be talking to Jeff Gordon. We've got a, just a lot to cover this week. I'm Greg Engel, editor cupscene.com. And as always, at least for now, until he gets kidnapped by a llama in Peru, the associate editor cupscene.com, Owen Johnson. Welcome, buddy. Hey, Greg. Thank you for having me. And I made it back from Peru, so we are all good for that. For that. <laughs> yeah. Well, savvy world traveler. All right. Let's talk Pocono. <laughs> Ryan Blaney won. It was his uh, his first career win came there in 2017 when he won with the Wood Brothers. Um, and that's his second win this year. And after going winless through 15 races and everybody was was piling on the defending series champ, uh, he now has two wins in the midst of this summer stretch as we go towards the playoffs. And it made me wonder, and, it, and somebody asked him, if he and his team are just at hit, hitting his stride. Yeah. I mean, I, I feel like the last two months we've been spectacular. Um, I feel like the speed in our cars have been great. A couple finishes might not reflect that, um, but it's really none of our doing. Um, some of them, I mean, you know, gateway, we had a great shot to win and just didn't really work out. New Hampshire. I thought we had a great run going and got spun out. And um, I, I am really feeling good about the speed in our cars um, right now across the board at Team Penske. I feel like we've we found a lot of stuff. I talked, you know, the last month of short tracks. You know, I think our short track program is fantastic, and we need to work on the mile and a half plus race tracks. And we come today to a to a big two and a half miler and win it. You know, so gosh, we've done our homework since Charlotte and and figure out how to be competitive and and compete with the the Hendrick boys and the and the Gibbs guys and 2311 and um, we're right there. So. Um, I feel like the summer last year, we struggled a little bit, uh, just trying to, to find some things that would work for us come playoff time. And, and I had to sit around all summer and hear people say that we suck and we didn't want that this year. You know, I mean, um, at the same time, we've been trying to find some things that are working for us uh, and they just have, you know, sometimes you, you try things that you want um to focus on that you feel like is going to make your team and your organization better and sometimes they work sometimes they don't and just what we've been doing this year has been working so i'm super proud of the effort all the all the boys and girls at team penske for putting the effort in um they are great at what they do and uh i couldn't find myself at another place because they just work really hard and they just put their heads down and figure out how to be better and um it's cool to drive for a company like that so it was good to see blaney win a lot happened uh, behind that i mean if you just focus on the leaders and the fuel mileage and everything that was going on it was a great race but there was a lot going on back in the field uh one of the highlights to me well you may not consider it a highlight if you're a kyle bush fan but his summer of discontent continued uh, on lap 121 with a bump from Corey lajoy that sent him into the wall out of the race coming into this week um there was a lot of controversy people said he you know, uh, everything from leave Corey alone to Corey should be banned for life and sent to an island, the same island that Napoleon went to. Um, but in the end, Elton Sawyer, NASCAR senior vice president of competition, said Tuesday that series officials, they weren't going to make a penalty, they weren't going to uh, levy a penalty, and they viewed the contact as a racing incident. He told NBC Sports, we're in race, we're in competition, we got two guys racing hard. You listen to the in-car audio on LaJoy's radio. You don't hear anything from the driver. There's some comments made by the crew chief and spotter. Neither one of them is driving the car. So you didn't hear anything from the driver. Yeah, they said they plan to have a conversation with Corey just to make sure he's in a good place. But yeah, that one, we let guys race. And when you see it that way, um, yeah, there was the, the crew chief did say some, some disparaging comments, but it didn't come from the driver. Uh, and, and, and unless we're sitting in that driver's seat in the heat of battle, so to speak, 
we really don't know what the mindset was. Uh, but I tend to lean towards um, not making a call on that. Um, although he did come out and, and talk to the media uh, and, and say those comments Elton did about why they didn't. So um, I, I, I know you agree with the call, Owen. Yeah, I do agree with it. And I think it's particularly um, because of a comment some of the officials made. Um, they should look at it further based on uh, social media reaction, to paraphrase. And I think these decisions just should not be based on the social media reaction. If NASCAR didn't think it was anything in the race, I think they should stand by that call. Social media really should not be deciding the penalties here. That's um, that's how we get that we fan the flames of the huge Wallace Bowman controversy we talked about last week. I think it was an iffy situation. Could have been called. We talk, um, obviously, Kyle Busch kind of got on the rev limiter. It, there's there's arguments for and against LaJoy, but if NASCAR didn't call it in the race, I don't think the social media reaction should be the reason they call it later. So I stand by that, mostly for that reason. And I'll go back to the Wallace-Bowman controversy at Chicago. Um, and a lot of, I think, a lot of that controversy had to do with the fact that, um, you know, poor Bubba Wallace has got his haters, and no matter what he does, it's going to be wrong in their eyes, and they're going to they're gonna sound off. And I agree with you. Penalties should not be decided by social media Though I do know that NASCAR does, you know, look at social media to gauge things, right? To gauge the interest in things. And the reason I, I think that, and I, and I think I got a strong case for this, is sometimes you'll see little leaks that'll come out from NASCAR that, oh, uh, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to race on the moon or something, you know, kind of out there. And then all of a sudden somebody will report it as NASCAR is talking about this. Um, an example of that is... Um, Someone reported this week that NASCAR told their employees to make sure their passports are up to date. Well, that's a pretty sure bet that we're either going to Canada or Mexico next year, even though the schedule still hasn't been released. Um, but it's leaks like that, and they kind of gauge the interest. Now, this one's a pretty set in stone, but there have been some in the past where NASCAR's maybe wanted to gauge, see what the feedback is from fans on certain things, uh, but certainly not in a penalty call, not on the field of play, they don't want to decide anything on that. Maybe they want to decide where we play. Um, you know, uh, I, I do know, for example, that at Chicago, they had people from other cities coming to look at the street race with the possibility of saying, you know, hey, we can do this kind of thing anywhere. So we may see another street race somewhere based on that. But um, I do think that sometimes they do gauge interest, but not penalties for sure. By the way, wrapping up Pocono, the garage area was littered with a total of 17 cars with DNFs. That was the most cars to finish with DNFs since the 2023 Daytona 500, which had a total of 17. Not something you typically see at Pocono, but there was a lot of carnage there. And I feel for the teams because obviously it cost the money, uh, but it made it interesting to the fans. And, and I thought it was a great race. I can't say that about every Pocono race. A lot of these Pocono races can get long and drawn out. Uh, but two different sets of fuel mileage uh, strategies, and it worked out to perfection for Ryan Blaney and his team. Good for him. Great win. Penske swept the weekend because there was a doubleheader in Iowa for IndyCar, and Penske won both of those. Uh, so that was good. So Penske sweep. Now Penske's got all three of their cars in the playoffs. As we go into the summer stretch towards the playoffs, um, they're going to be three of the contenders for sure. It'll be interesting to see how far they go. All right, let's catch up on some news. To, Go ahead. And just to clarify on that, it was it was 13 cars that failed to finish. The Daytona 500 had 17, so just four short, but not not quite the same number. Well, I said the garage area was literally a total of 13 cars. Did I say 17? 17, yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I shouldn't be drinking this early. Um, <laughs> no, it was 13 cars, 13 DNFs, guys. Um, Owen's keeping me honest. Um, 13 cars. There were 17 in that 2023 Daytona 500. Um, so bottom line, there was a lot of carnage at, at, <laughs> at, at Pocono, which is not something Pocono is normally known for. So it was, it was a good race, um, but felt bad for the teams that did crash. And I felt, I feel bad for Kyle Busch and, and hope he, uh, hope he can turn things around. So, uh, we'll see about that. All right, let's move on to other news. JD Motorsports, uh, won't enter a car this weekend at Indy. Uh, they filed for chapter 11 bankruptcy in South Carolina in early April. Um, and that allowed the team to compete, to keep competing um, while reorganizing the debt. But they've decided that uh, they, they've actually given their number and their charter to another team. So 
uh, JD Motorsports, unfortunately, is probably um, not going to be around much longer. It's a shame, but, uh, you know, teams come and go, especially these smaller teams. It's just uh, it's just a, a part of this a part of this uh, sport. It's hard. It's hard and it's expensive. And uh, I remember Dale Earnhardt Jr. one time said, if you want to make a lot of money in racing, you start with uh, or you want to make a little money in racing, you got to start with a lot of money. So there you go. So it's tough. Um, but we're entering the, the, the off week now. And during the off week, Daniel Suarez will be uh, competing in Brazil at Interlagos, which uh, sounds like it would be a lot of fun. I've been to Interlagos. What a great track. Um, and Brazil is just, just a cool place. He's actually getting married down there. He's finally, finally marrying uh, Julia Piquet, daughter of uh, three-time F1 champ Nelson Piquet. Um, and, you know, why not celebrate your wedding by racing? So he's going to do that in the Brazil series. So that'll be fun to watch. He's going to be racing a Camaro down there. Um, and something about uh, Julia, I have seen her at tracks. And she is the most intense and focused person I've ever seen. When Daniel's out on the track, whether it's, uh, you know, during practice or qualifying, she will be anywhere but the pit box. Now, during the race, she's usually at the pit box. Um, setting with everybody else but she is just the most intense looking for and she's kind of want to stand out of the way um, but she's a former television reporter there um, in Brazil and and uh, you know good for them a happy for him uh, our newest American citizen and he'll be racing down there speaking of racing in a couple of weeks we're going to Richmond which I know Owen is near and dear to your heart because that's that's in that's in your area um, and for the NASCAR Cup Series weekend at Richmond they've announced that they're going to use uh, standard prime tires and also option tires for use during the weekend, one for practice, two for the race. Um, and the same thing they did at the all-star race at North Wilkesboro Speedway, the prime tire will have yellow lettering and the options with red. Um, there's eight sticker sets for the red, six prime, two option. Now NASCAR for the race was not going to mandate the teams use their sets. However, all four tires must match at all times, so no running primes on the right and options on the left. I don't think any team would do that. Now, let me, let me say this about that. I think it would be more interesting if NASCAR did mandate that you use one set each of tires during a race. I really do. Because I'm going to be honest with you, at North Wilkesboro when we ran them, uh, I was there for that. It, it, it didn't see a big, that big of a difference to me. Um, but you know, I'm not in the car. I don't know if it got easier to drive or harder to drive. It didn't seem like that was going to be that big a deal. Um, so I'm, I, I wonder if it's going to be that big a deal at Richmond, if one tire is going to give them more speed over the other tires. Um, and, and, and I think that if we mandated them like they do in formula one, formula one says you have to run a certain set of tires, uh, Indy car the same way. I think if we did that, uh, it would be a lot bigger deal and a lot more exciting and a lot more strategy for, for the teams and for the fans. Um, but they're not mandating them yet, but I'll bet you that's going to be their, their next choice, uh, their next step. What do you think about that, Owen? Well, I think that's definitely the biggest difference from the all-star race, the choice element. The only, uh, the only time they don't have a choice is in qualifying when they must use the prime set. Um, but there at North Wilkesboro, they were forced to start on the option tire and that gave them the choice from there. And the winning choice ended up being sticking with the option tire, not, not changing tires. Um, at Richmond, which is a longer race that might be, they might play differently. That might be more strategy elements than a shorter all-star race format. And I think the cruise will have a lot more say, especially since Richmond has really become a strategy racetrack. So there's another strategy element here. And I think it's perfect timing for the strategy race that always is Richmond of all the tracks to adopt these tires. I think it's, I think Richmond is the perfect one for it. Now I forgot, are you going to be back in England by then? Or are you going to, you're going to try and go to Richmond? I will be in England for, uh, during Richmond. Then I'll be back after that, back for some more racing in Daytona, Atlanta later this year. Okay. All right. So you're going to miss Richmond. <laughs> I think we're going to get together at Daytona because Daytona is my home track. Um, so that'll be fun. Um, you can you can uh, teach me some some basic law anyway. Anyway, speaking <laughs> of tires, six teams tested tires at Bristol this week, um, which I thought was kind of strange because the tires were such a big deal in the spring race and it gave such a great race. Um, I sure as heck hope they don't change it up too much from what they had in the spring. Um, but six teams tested tires. Um, Goodyear can do their thing, but hopefully they're going to bring that same compound back 
and we're going to have just a good race on the night race as we did in the spring race, which was a phenomenal race. All right. Just rant and rave like you do to the TV during sports. Before we move away from Pocono, let's park it here for a second. And that's a uh, pun intended because uh, while I wasn't there, there were plenty of reports about traffic getting in the track Sunday. And there was reports that some fans didn't get in until the race was well underway. And there was even a few who said they missed it completely. Now, there was an early morning thunderstorm, which the track said forced them to get, have everyone get out of the weather, um, including their, their employees. And I get that. If you've got lightning around, you don't want people running around. Uh, and, and, you know, the, the, the parking lots are grass. And as we saw at North Wilkesboro, that turns them into mud. So I get it. Uh, but I, I really don't know if that was the whole reason. And, and I think we may never know. The track, of course, apologized. Um, but if you did miss part of a race, you deserve at least a partial refund. And by all means, if you missed an entire race, if your ticket never got scanned, you deserve nothing short of a full refund. And I hope you get it. Um, we can think back to a couple of years ago when Kentucky Speedway first opened. Um, parking was such a nightmare there. Um, that they had the same same effect. People missed the race because they couldn't get into the track. The next year, Kentucky Speedway uh, had a whole PR thing. We fixed it, and I remember going to the to the media tour. We had the when we back when we had the media tours, and Kentucky Speedway had had set up this whole thing where they were going to do a press conference, and they did the press conference, but they had traffic cones and they had like, like under construction things. It was really kind of cool, but their whole thing was uh, that that they had fixed the parking problem. They, 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 they did, and it was easier, but they never fixed it uh, completely. And you can see because Kentucky Speedway is no longer on the schedule. Am I saying that's going to happen with Pocono? No, I think this is a one-time deal. Um, something happened behind the scenes we're not hearing about, maybe. Uh, and maybe it was just the weather. I don't know. Whatever the reason is, as long as the track makes it right with the fans who missed part of the race or all of the race, um, and we don't have this this again then then fine we'll move on look my advice now i go to plenty of races a year i don't go to all of them anymore um and and i be honest i don't miss that kind of grind but um here's my here's what i do i show up a minimum of four hours before green flag now granted i a lot of times have to have things going on we have press conferences i have to you know meet with a driver or a team for a story um, but I, I, I can't remember a time other than back in the late eighties, maybe when you used to go to Daytona, look, if you, if the Daytona race started at noon or one o'clock, uh, back in the eighties, if you weren't there at sunrise, you were going to set in traffic. I mean, there was 300,000 people. So, you know, back then you got there. I, I remember leaving my house at four in the morning for the 30 to 45 minute drive up there just to, to just to miss traffic and still, uh, missing track, you know, still getting in some traffic. So here's my bottom line. Come four hours early because you can't, a NASCAR race is not a, an afternoon thing. It's an entire day. You need to go tailgate, hang out, meet fans, enjoy the day. Uh, and it's an all day affair. So, so plan on coming early, going to the midway. If the gate's not open yet, that's fine. Hang out. Like I said, with fans, bring a grill if you can, if you got a pickup or whatever. Or trust me, you'll make some friends going to a NASCAR race. And if you don't like to sit in traffic, make it a minimum of four hours before the race. Now, that being said, I don't want to blame anybody that that at Pocono who said I went two hours before the race and didn't miss and miss the race. You should still be able to get to the race. It may take a little longer, but four hours is my minimum. And with post race, you don't want to jump on you know, the highway, as soon as the checker, soon after the checkered flag falls again, granted, I normally don't leave for a couple hours after the race, but I've got post-race stuff to do. But a lot of times you could go to your park, go to the parking lot and do kind of a reverse tailgate where you hang out in the parking lot. I remember doing that for years at Daytona uh, because thus us in the media, even two hours after the race, there was still a lot of traffic. Those days are long gone, sadly. Um, we used to go to the parking lot and we'd have a little campfire and we would drink and have a, and, a, and have a ball. But um, now if you wait a couple hours after the race, you're usually not going to run into traffic. Um, but 
sure. I, you, you know, like I said, I have a reason to stay there for a couple hours afterwards. Um, but you can either sit at the track and relax in your car or be stressed out sitting in traffic. It's your choice. It's going to be that way. And by the way, if you're one of those people who like to lead 20 laps before the end, well, I curses on you. Plenty happens in the final laps. We've seen that this year. Uh, you paid the money, get the full experience and avoid the traffic or set in the traffic. But the bottom line is most tracks do a great job of traffic control. Uh, and because experiences like what happened at Pocono sour it for fans. And trust me, without you fans, none of us would have a job. And we want to make sure that the experience is as best it can possibly be. And that includes not getting in, you know, not, not getting stuck coming into the track or going out. So that's my rant about that. Also, another trick I want to tell you, if you're going to travel to a NASCAR race, you're going to stay in a hotel. If you don't see a hotel right by the track, I have stayed 30 to 40 minutes away usually, and you'll find the best rates. And usually 30 to 40 minutes driving to a race, if you go early, is not a big deal. So that's my tip for you. 40 minutes away, three to four hours before the race starts and plan on hanging out um, for a couple hours afterwards. What's your take on this, Owen? Well, I'll say just going back to the Pocono deal itself, my experience with Pocono, and I was fortunate to go to that, up to that race last year, my experience with it was it, the traffic situation is always a little bit more difficult at Pocono. And that's not a reflection on whoever's doing the traffic management. It's not a reflection on NASCAR, all the local police. That's just a reality of where the track is. It's surrounded by just a few two-lane country roads. There's not a lot, of, a lot of options to route the cars on, and there's not many entrances into the track itself. Um, Pocono is definitely the exception. Most tracks... You're never going to wait that long to get in. Obviously, some some you will. Now, I'll admit we were in New York, too. So we were far outside your 40 minute rule uh, so we could watch a soccer game on Sunday. But that is or on Saturday before the race. But that's just my London side coming out. And the extra drive was entirely our own fault. Um, and ordinarily, I definitely agree with you. Stay within 40 minutes, leave relatively early. But don't think that Pocono is the rule. That is definitely the exception. There's usually quite good traffic management, but know the track. Sometimes tracks like Pocono will have a little bit more time. You have to budget, wake up. And we woke up plenty, plenty early to get there on time for Pocono. I always forget it's so close to New York. That just, that just kind of blows my mind. Uh, you're, you're, uh, you're not that far from New York to go to Pocono. All right, putting Pocono behind us. I'll tell you this, though. I'm glad we don't go there two, yet, two times a year anymore like we used to. We used to go like a month apart. I just I never understood that. Then they did that disaster of a double header. Uh, but they tried it and it didn't work out. So uh, we put that behind us and we look forward to the Brickyard. That's right. The Brickyard, the big track for the first time since 2020. We're not going to be on the road course. And I'm happy for that. It's going to be great to see them back on the big, big course on the big track. One driver who will be getting the full Indy NASCAR experience is Connor Daly. He's raced on the Oval in the Indy 500 sub for Jack Harvey in the IndyCar race at Iowa last weekend, and he'll be competing in the truck race at IRP on Friday, uh, Indianapolis Raceway Park. I know it's some kind of O'Reilly parts, oil, slick track, 400, whatever. It'll always be IRP to me, one of my favorite little tracks. I used to love to cover races there because their media center was a double wide trailer in the infield, uh, and we used to have to tranche through the mud. He's going to be racing there Friday night. Uh, and then he's going to be um, in the Xfinity race on Saturday. I had a chance to spend a few minutes with him this week. We talked about that um, and, and, some, and, and him going into Indy and what it's like to not be a full-time driver and to be able to pop around to different series, whether it's open wheel and NASCAR um, and, and other forms of racing. And, and good morning, Connor. Uh, I'm Morning. extremely jealous of, of your life, ma'am, seeing you bounce <laughs> around these disciplines. I know you want to be full-time, but I know it's got to be a blast. IndyCar and trucks and, and cars. I, I'm curious, though, when you do that, do you have like a personal services contract or something that, that follows you? Or do you have to like adapt to different sponsors when you go to these different series and, 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 and that – uh, you know, and I'm looking more on the, the sponsorship side. How hard is it to juggle the fact that you're putting these one race deals together with the fact that you have to find, you know, either a personal services contract to follow you or or some kind of, you know, delivering the sponsorship to the team you're going to? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, there's there. I mean, I'm super honest with everything. If I don't know if you listen to my podcast, but like I will always talk about the reality 
of these things. And like, yeah, the only reason I'm racing is not because I've been selected to participate. It's like we have partnerships that have made this happen, right? Like there's, you know, there's money involved, of course, you know, Power Plus, who's on the truck this weekend, has been a supporter of mine for a long time. People I met through Travis Pastrana when we went boat racing together, you know, mm -hmm. randomly. So you got to keep these uh, these relationships uh, strong. And obviously, Polkadot, who's our Indy 500 partner, they're, they're along with us for uh, for the Xfinity race and then the next two truck races that I'm doing as well. So uh, the, the, the whole goal of... Well, I mean, the only reason I essentially still have a career is because of my the relationship building that you have to do in this sport, the putting yourself in position to be a race car driver. Uh, I, I would like to, you know, just continue to be able to do that and make it worth everyone's time. But like, you know, ev every deal that we work on is uh, is essentially, you know, what can we do with what we have? And so like, this is what we have right now. There will be Unless a miracle happens, you know, we're not adding any more than what we've all announced. Like we've been working on this whole program for uh, for a long time, for like six, eight months um, just to do something. Although the Xfinity deal came up very randomly, like very last minute. Um, but uh, but it was a great opportunity to, to be able to do that. But again, it's it's an available seat, costs a certain amount of money. We all are familiar with how this sport works nowadays. So um but yeah we, but that's what we that's what we do we try to build these partnerships make everyone proud of us and polka dot love the indy 500 we obviously went and had a good chance at winning that race once again um and and got them a really strong finish so we want to try to obviously keep delivering for them uh as we go and then and then we'll see what happens my goal is to you know strengthen one of these partnerships to the to the to the level that we can you know look at a couple full-time options in something next year i don't know what that is yet <laughs> i don't know if i ever will outstanding and and as a follow-up, based on your limited sim experience with Toyota um, on the big track, do, do you see, is there anything at all that you think you might be able to carry over from, from the, the, the 500 into the Xfinity car, or is it just too, too different of a discipline? I mean, I, I've been trying to think of that myself. I, I actually don't know until I get out there um, from the sim experience. I mean, it's, it seems to be, in the sim, at least you're close to flat in a couple of the corners, not all of them. Um, but, you know, obviously our goal at Indy is to be flat and for four laps and qualifying. But realistically, in the race, you're not you're not flat at all unless you're by yourself. So, uh, you know, there's going to be lifting. There's going to be a, I think the visual references, I think uh, every bump in the track is something that I feel like I know in my soul because I've done so many laps there. So you kind of know where the grip is and and when it is and then how much of the track you can use. I I, I do think a lot of that information will translate. Um, but until I actually do the first practice session, you know, I won't really know. So um, I, I'm hoping more translates than I think. But uh there's definitely going to be just a, a few things track knowledge wise and, and kind of what, what the track does and what, it, you know, every part about, you know, spacing and, and stuff like that. I think it should be useful. No, so you got me thinking um, you race these different disciplines and yeah, you want to have a full-time ride, right. Wherever that happens to be. But one of the advantages is because you're sitting there talking about one in the Daytona 500, you've been in the Indy 500, you've been in the Daytona 500. I mean, come on, that's 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 really like a cool resume to have, man. Is there a, a race that or or a discipline that you would like to try just to kind of add to that bucket list? Because it's it's pretty incredible if you ask me. <laughs> I mean, honestly, the the only thing left for me that is that is massively on the bucket list is the Le Mans 24 hour race. Mm -hmm. uh, really want to do Le Mans. Uh, have have not had a chance to do that quite yet, um, but that's really for sure the the last the last one on the bucket list. Um, I I mean, part of me, I actually almost legitimately had a deal to do the uh, the the V8 Supercar race at Bathurst, the Bathurst 1000. Wow. Uh, had a contract, was going to do the race uh with andretti uh me and alexander rossi uh and last second uh they switched me with with james hinchcliffe so i was like oh that that would have been a really cool one to do um but uh i have i for some uh, there's no way in the world that that chance will probably ever come again but who knows we'll see so um so those are pretty pretty high on the bucket list but uh but yeah i've been very lucky i've had a lot of great uh partners to put me in positions to do that i've, I've had a lot of great interactions uh, this sport, I, I've actually met a lot of fantastic people in the 
uh, in the NASCAR realm. Uh, I, I really enjoy uh, communicating. Certainly with Sam Hunt has been really cool. Uh, Cody and Al Nice, like Al Nice calls me before like every Indy 500. Like he's he's a very very nice guy to me. Very supportive. Um, and, uh, and, and I, and I, I just, I have enjoyed working with the people that, uh, that I've worked with. Um, and, and, and it's, it's a great sport and, and I, I, uh, I hope to be able to do more, but, uh, yeah, um, I, I am here now and I know what's happening this week. And after that, who knows what else can happen <laughs> and remind, and remind me again of, uh, and, and folks, what your podcast is so we can find it. Great question. Yeah. Uh, the speed street podcast. I have an interview with Will Power here in 10 minutes or 15 minutes or so. Uh, we, yeah, it's, it's, it's on, we're under Dale Earnhardt Jr.'s, uh, dirty mo media banner. So, um, maybe not quite as popular as Denny Hamlin's podcast, but you know, we're going to, we're going to work on it. All right. Thanks pal. Thank you. By the way, on Saturday, there's going to be a press announcement, a media availability, uh, with reigning NASCAR Xfinity series champion, Cole Custer, where, quote, the 26-year-old racer will announce his 2025 plans. Well, guess what? I think we're going to get the announcement that we've all been waiting for. He's going to be the full-time cup driver for the revamped Haas Racing next year. The one-car cup team ran by, run by Gene Haas and, and uh, Cole's dad. So we're looking for that Saturday. So we're going back to the big track. And I think no matter what we do, this first brace back on this big track is going to be phenomenal. It's going to be great. We've got the next gen cars. Everything is going to be wonderful. There's 30 years since Jeff Gordon won the first one. So we're going to be celebrating that. Uh, Mr. Hendricks is going to be driving the pace car. We'll see that. So it's going to be great. But, and there should be a good turnout, but we have to be wary because well, the racing that we're going to see on Saturday and Sunday, Saturday, we've got the Xfinity race <clears throat> on Sunday. Is that going to keep these crowds coming back? I mean, I remember the last Xfinity race there. It seemed to run in front of nearly empty seats, given the fact that, of course, uh, the, the, it's cavernous, right? I mean, it's a cavernous place. If you've ever been there, I've been there. Um, it's huge, but it was just, it wasn't a good optic. So we're going to have to see if, People get tired of being back on the Oval, but we'll get past that next year because this year it's going to be fantastic. It's going to be phenomenal. And I know you're looking forward to it, Owen. Absolutely. And I think a, a theme I got from the drivers in some of their pre-race uh, coverage this week has been that the, the Oval is just a little bit more special. So whether or not the fans come, and I really hope they do, the drivers are certainly looking, uh, looking forward to it. And that's true of one driver who I got to speak to this week, a Cup Series driver who has just as recent experience in the Indy Oval as daily. And that's Kyle Larson, who ran the Indy 500 this year. And an attempt at the double, obviously, Charlie got rained out. We talked about that at the time. But he said um, the Indy car experience didn't really translate to the cup car, since the cars are so different. So I asked him whether that uh, whether he remembers the old cup car, the previous generation, four years ago, and whether that carries over on the Oval. And then, ultimately, whether he prefers the Oval or the road course. So here's what he told me. Hi, Kyle. Thanks for your time. Um, on the other hand, to how the Indy cars drive, how much do you remember from how the old cup cars used to drive on the Oval? And how does that experience with the previous generation translate to today based on what you've seen from the simulator and any other prep leading up to the race? Uh, yeah, I, I haven't done any prep. I don't I don't ever do any sim stuff. But, um, you know, Indy is a pretty simple racetrack. Um, you know, there's not really two ways to get around it. Um, I mean, there's probably two ways. There's probably not more than two ways, though, to get around it. So, um, you know, turn one is a slick corner. Usually you get really tight on exit. You know, you get tight typically in the middle of two. Um, and then three and four, you usually have more grip. I don't know if that's just the way that the sun sets or – or what but turn three has got some bumps but it, it usually is a grip of your balance and then same with turn four so it felt that way in the indy car as well and i imagine it'll still feel that same way you know old car versus new car i think the balance of what i just described will be similar um indy was very tough to pass in the past with the old car and i think it'll be even tougher to this time so you know, executing a great strategy and also, you know, having good pit stops and restarts 
all that's going to be important. So I, th- I think restarts with the way our cars are now and the durability and toughness and then how difficult it is to pass. I think restarts are going to be very, very aggressive and um, crazy. So um, that's where I think the majority of the excitement will come from. But um, yeah, I think our, our car should hopefully be good. Uh, I think we have some good data points after Pocono. You know, we were not very good, but Chase was really strong. So I think we can look at some notes there and hopefully we'll be competitive this weekend. And are you looking forward to heading to the Oval any more than you did the road course in the past years? I really enjoy the road course. Um, but, you know, when you, at least for me, when I think of Indy, I want to win on the Oval. If I could pick, you know, winning on the road course or the Oval, I would take the, the Oval. So I feel like now we have a, a crown jewel event back. I didn't think that the road course was much of a crown jewel. It just felt like another race um, where now the Brickyard 400 is back. So, you know, that's a, that's a race on everybody's bucket list. Um, I don't really know if anybody in the field has won the Brickyard 400 before. So, um, yeah, it's one that, that we all want to win. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Kyle Larson is going to be a contender this week, I, I think. Um, so speaking of Jeff Gordon, he famously won there, the Brickyard 400 in 1994. He spent a lot of time at Indy. He grew up near the track. He was telling me that he used to get, uh, when he was sponsored by Valvoline, um, the oil that Valvoline had came from, you, you would go actually to, to garage, Gasoline Alley, the garage area, to get your, get your oil from Valvoline because they were based at the track. So he spent a lot of time at, at, at Indy. And I know he may not have the same sort of awe of the place he used to be, but now he's an executive at Hendrick, uh, which is still bizarro to me. Um, I got a chance to ask him about going back there and seeing his former car racing on that track with William Byron behind the wheel. I know the, the awe you could feel when you walk into to India has been tempered somewhat because you've been there and you spent so much time there. But can, have you allowed yourself to imagine what it would be like to see William Byron deliver that 24 into victory lane? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's hard when you drove the 24 your entire career. You know, it, it you know, you, you it's 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 certainly something that's that's very near and dear to my heart but at the same time and i i just think william's a great race car driver and a great person and, and rudy and the whole team i mean you know they're fantastic i love what they're doing um but in my role you know I, i'm spending equal amount of time with all the drivers and all the teams and and cheering for all of them um so you know, I know that our fan base, I know that our sponsors and, and I know, you know, that it, that, that William and Rudy, they both carry a lot of pride representing that 24 and the fan base. And so I think they know they're going to feel a little bit of added pressure this weekend because of what happened 30 years ago. But I also know that's just motivating them to, to deliver because they, they want it themselves just as bad as anybody else does. Thanks as always for your time, Jeff. I appreciate it. So you would think that my pick for this week would be a Hendrick driver, that it would be William Byron. And that would be a great story if the 24 won, um, as, as Jeff said, but any of the Hendrick cars won. But my pick is a Penske driver. They seem to be having a dream season. All the drivers have won. They swept, as we mentioned, Iowa and IndyCar, and then Blaney won at Pocono last weekend. And Roger Penske does own the track. So why wouldn't it be a Penske driver? Which Penske driver? I'm going to say Joey Logano. And I think that he's due, and it would not surprise me at all to see Joey Logano, or if not a Penske driver, in victory lane this Sunday. And what's your take, Owen? Well, one thing that Kyle Larson said that I thought was really interesting is that he didn't really feel anything different, any new emotion coming to um, Indy with the Hendrick car. Since the Ganassi cars that he used to drive were always set up so well for the track, and obviously he got quite good results in the 42 back back in those days. Well, the Ganassi team is now the track house team. The 99, t- the 99 car was so close to winning on the road course at Indy last year, and their one team really needs a win this year. So I think it's going to be the one of Ross Chastain getting the win this weekend in a Ganassi car turned track house with that good setup that Larson talked about. Interesting. So there you go. Ross Chastain or... Joey Logano, we'll have to see. By the way, Trackhouse Racing, 
uh, took on an investment partner this week, which uh, was kind of bizarre. I do have the coverage on that on Forbes. I also have coverage of my conversation with Connor Daly. I'll have that up later this week. You're going to have a preview out this week, and I'm sure it's going to be heavily favored in Ross Chastain's favor. Is that safe to say? We'll keep it unbiased. I'll get all the driver's opinions. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right, check out cupscene.com, Forbes Sports Money, for my coverage of the sports angle or the business angle of NASCAR. Then we'll come out next week. We'll, we'll get ready for the two-week break. I think next week we're going to talk Olympics. We'll see. And we'll maybe we'll get some Olympic picks. So I'll put that on your radar, Owen. All right, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Have fun this weekend. We appreciate your support. Like, subscribe. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Speed Talk Live. For questions or just to tell us how bad our production is or to leave other feedback, leave us a comment below. For all the latest NASCAR news, visit www.cupscene.com. Until next time, peace out and let's go racing.